الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد respected listeners today we completed the remaining portion of surah an-nisa and then we started surah al-maida surah an-nisa the final contents of surah an-nisa are actually very similar to surah al-maida so i'll just mention them together the section that we recited today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by speaking about evil or ill speech Allah does not like anyone saying anything offensive then Allah has also mentions those people who believe in some of the prophets alayhim salatu wassalam but refuse to believe in the rest Allah says these are the true disbelievers and I will return to this topic later on. Allah then mentions about Allah mentions the Jews again that they make unreasonable demands of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Allah tells them don't worry this is nothing new they did this to their own prophets alayhi salatu wasalam. So for example today they are asking you that we won't believe in you until you bring us a book that has been revealed from the heavens in a physical form. So the Prophet ﷺ was hurt and grieved by this that they won't believe him and trust him and they are demanding physical proof. So Allah says, don't let this grieve you. For they did, this, they did worse than this with their own prophets. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. When Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam invited them, you see, he actually brought a book. He gave them what they were, want, what they were demanding, i.e. the book. They still weren't satisfied. Some of them still said to him, that we won't believe until you show us Allah in person. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about other things, their other misdemeanors and misbehavior. How Allah raised a mountain above them. Allah instructed them to not transgress with regards to the Sabbath. How Allah took a very strict covenant off them. Yet they broke their covenant, they violated their promise. They continued to commit kufr with the signs of Allah. They executed the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam and murdered them without just cause. And they actually defiantly said that قُلُوبُنَا غُلْفُ Our hearts are sealed. I.e. they used to tell their prophets and they used to say amongst themselves that look, we will never become any better. Our hearts are sealed. How they slandered Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam and when she brought forth Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam in a miraculous way, they accused her of adultery. Until this day, they continue to accuse her of adultery. How they boasted of killing Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And the words are, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحِ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ You see, the Jews, for a long, long time, boasted of killing Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. They were the ones who became fed up of his teaching and his preaching. They went and complained of him and leveled false accusations against him to who? To the Roman governor of Jerusalem. And one of the most serious things that they accused him of in the court of the Roman rulers was that he claims to be a prophet and a new king and he wishes to overthrow your authority and become the new ruler of Jerusalem so the Roman rulers weren't too bothered about what he was saying regarding religion or other things etc but when the Jews to whom Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was sent falsely accused him of trying to rebel against the Roman authority and to incite and foment trouble against them and to lead a rebellion and to overthrow their power, that's when they took notice. And they just accepted whatever the Jews were telling him, them, and they arrested him, and what followed, followed. He wasn't the one who was uh, crucified. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced him with someone else, the traitor. But when the traitor, when the traitor was executed himself, and he was crucified, and Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam was miraculously lifted up to the heavens, Still the Jews boasted for long afterwards and continue to boast till this day that we were the ones who killed 
Isa. And Allah quotes them in the following manner. Allah says, and because of their statements that we killed the Messiah, Isa, the son of Maryam, the messenger of Allah. So they didn't just say we killed Isa, the imposter. They actually sarcastically said, we killed the Messiah, Isa, the son of Maryam, the messenger of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because of all of these misdeeds and the, these blasphemies, Allah cursed them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to speak about the Yahud, how they transgressed, how they continued to consume riba, how they consumed the wealth of people unjustly. Inna lillah. Allah speaks at length about them. Then Allah speaks about the Christians. That, O oh people of the book, do not transgress and do not say of Allah that he is one of the three, that there is a trinity. And how can Allah have a son? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam. That Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam himself will never feel embarrassed or feel any sense of disgrace and humiliation in considering himself a servant of Allah and nothing more. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam will never disdain being a servant. So if he himself, not only him but even the closest angels, the greatest angels no one will ever disdain being a servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even Isa, Ibn Maryam alayhim as salatu was salam so why should the Christians be fearful of reducing him to any level below the son of God why should they be, why should they feel any reservation in considering him a servant of Allah and his prophets and no more then we recite Surah Al-Ma'idah in the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals some laws about the state of ihram and about hunting in ihram and also which uh, meats are halal, which ones aren't. Some more laws about hunting with dogs are mentioned. The food of the people of the book, this is mentioned. Then Allah speaks about the laws of wudu and ghusl and personal purity and tayammum when a person intends to pray salah. Allah also mentions some social etiquettes and laws that Muslims must abide by. One of them is to be establishers of justice and to be just in our dealings with everybody, including our enemies. And in this regard, there are two very beautiful verses in the beginning of Surah Al-Ma'idah at a short space of one another. Allah says, O believers, be establishers, be, stand upright, be upright for the sake of Allah and be establishers of justice. And do not let the enmity of a certain people lead you to committing injustice. Be just as close as taqwa. And fear Allah, Allah is well aware of what you are doing. And the other verse in that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, that do not let the enmity of people who have prevented, who have prevented you from al-masjid al-haram incite you to committing any transgression against them. Rather assist one another in righteousness and in piety, in taqwa. And do not assist one another in sin and transgression. See, very simply, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were traveling to Mecca. They were prevented from entering the city of Mecca in the sixth year of Hijrah. And they were forced to camp at uh, about six miles away from Mecca at the site of Hudaybiyah. That's when the truce took place, before the truce. The Sahaba were very angry. They were in the state of Ihram. They had come in peace with the intention of uh, performing Umrah and entering the holy city, but they were prevented from doing so, including Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, the people who prevented them from entering the city were the Quraysh, the residents of Mecca. At that time, there were some caravans from other tribes outside Mecca that were heading towards Mecca for the pilgrimage. And the, some of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum thought that, see, these visiting caravans making their way to Mecca. They are pagans, just like the mushrikeen in, uh, uh, of Quraysh in Mecca. They are their brethren in shirk and in kufr. They are their allies. And look, they, will, they prevent us and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from entering the city. But they are allowing these people to go through. So why don't we retaliate? And why don't we stop these people from approaching the city, just like we have been prevented from approaching the city? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses. That all believers do not transgress i.e. the people who have committed an injustice against you and the people who are your true enemies 
are those who have prevented you from entering the city and they are the Quraysh in Mecca. And these people, though they may be their brethren in shirk and in kufr, though they may not be Muslims, as far as this particular injustice is concerned, they have no part to play in it. And they are making their way to the house of Allah, despite their shirk and despite their kufr, with good intentions. Even though they may be allies of the kufr, but not formally. So, do not let your anger and your hatred of the Quraysh lead you to committing any injustice and transgressing against these people. This is contrary to piety, righteousness and taqwa. And assist one another in righteousness and in taqwa and do not assist one another in sin and in transgression. Allahu Akbar. Look at the justice of Islam. Look at the justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed the believers to observe and to uphold. And we can't even observe that justice amongst ourselves. The slightest Enmity, slightest hatred for another person, and that's it. All the laws are thrown aside, all considerations are cast aside. Just because we have some difference with a person, we believe that his blood, his wealth, his honor, his izza, his dignity, everything is halal for us. Astaghfirullah. Look at this. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum not to attack. The mushrikeen, simply because they had no part to play in the grievance that the Sahaba suffered. Allah then speaks about the Jews at length again, mentioning their many acts of betrayal and their misdemeanors and their misbehavior. So many to, so many. Allah then speaks about the Christians again, and Allah mentions in this verse, Verily, those people have committed kufr Who have said that Allah He is the Messiah, the son of Maryam And in the other verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Verily, those people who say that Allah is one of the three They have committed kufr Now I said I would return to that topic later I.e. the very third verse which we recited today in which Allah speaks of those people who seek to divide faith in his prophets والسلام, believing in some and disbelieving in the rest some Muslims are of the opinion that um, the Jews and the Christians are believers and that they shall go to Jannah and that they are under no obligation whatsoever to believe in Rasulullah or to believe in the Quran and even if they die as Christians and as Jews, they will go to Jannah. And because they are the people of the book, they have a very special place, i.e. in Islam, in religion, i.e. they are believers. And I mentioned this before once, I was speaking about this topic, and this gentleman came up to me, well, this person came up to me in the masjid after the Tarawi Salah, and very abusively said, that if Allah has spoken about the people of the book in the Quran in a certain way, then who are you to say otherwise? That I, Allah has said they are the people of the book and they are believers. So why are you saying they are disbelievers? It's not me saying they are disbelievers. The Quran says they are disbelievers. And we should not misunderstand these verses of the Quran. Allah has spoken about the Jews and the Christians in a particular way. And Allah has named the people, Allah has called them the people of the book. You see, calling them the people of the book is not necessarily giving them a certain privilege. They are privileged in certain aspects, but by calling them the people of the book, Allah is basically reminding them over and over again that by being believers of the earlier scriptures, such as the Torah and the Injil of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, they have a greater obligation and duty upon themselves to embrace the religion of Islam. Because the religion of Islam and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ are a continuation of the same principles that Allah revealed in the Torah and in the Injil to Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Isa alayhi respectively. So for the people of the book to embrace Islam should be easier than any other one, anyone else. So along with the privilege of the Ahl Kitab, there is a responsibility. And furthermore, 
Allah has called them the Ahli Kitab, but if you look at most of the verses of the Qur'an, Allah does not speak of them in very favorable terms. In many verses, time and time again, the Jews have been cursed by Allah. And if I was, you see, every day in the summary, I mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Ali Imran, in Surah Al-Nisa, in Surah Al-Ma'idah today, it's the same, verse after verse speaks about the Yahud in a very disparaging way, with no honor and izzah whatsoever. Allah speaks about his anger on them, Allah speaks about his scorn at them, Allah speaks about his curse that he threw at them. Allah speaks about their betrayal, their breaking of the covenant, their persecution of the prophets, their murdering uh, the prophets, والسلام, their blasphemy. Where in all of this is there any praise? And where in all of this do we get any idea that the Yahud are believers and they shall go to Jannah? So this verse clearly says, you see, the Christians, let's just look at the Christians. The Christians, there are, they have many, Christians of many denominations. And there are maybe one or two very small, almost negligible in terms of number, denominations that do not believe in the same blasphemous beliefs of the remaining de- de- denominations. Otherwise, a clear majority of the Christians, Protestant, Roman, first of all Roman Catholic, Orthodox, as well as Protestant. And when we say Protestant, we include all of the offshoots and the branches that have risen <coughs> after the Protestant movement. A clear majority of the Christians they believe in one of these beliefs. Either they believe like the Roman Catholics that Maryam is the mother of God and that there is a trinity. Now the Protestants may not believe that it's about the mother of God but they still believe in the trinity. And the Orthodox Christians also believe in the trinity and they also believe in, uh, just like the Roman Catholics, in the divinity of Maryam uh, and they hail her as a mother of God. Now, even if they do not believe in the divinity of Maryam alayhi salatu was salam, as long as they believe in the trinity, and even if they don't believe in the trinity, as long as they believe that he is the son of Allah, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, or even if they do not believe that, but they believe that Isa alayhi salatu salam is God himself, and Allah is Isa alayhi salatu salam, Allah has caused, called all of these things kufr in the Quran. Kufr. Allah says here, verily, those people have disbelieved who have said that Allah, He is the Messiah, the Son of Money. Now, where in there do we get any idea that the Christians are believers? Categorically stated, anyone who holds this belief is a kafir. And I said I would get back to the other verse. Allah says, this is the third verse that uh, we recited today Allah says verily those who disbelieve in Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam and who seek to draw a distinction between Allah and his messengers alayhi wa salatu wa salam and they say we believe in some and we disbelieve in the rest and they seek to plod a path in between these two things the ulaikahumul kafirun haqqa. These are the people who are truly, with haqq, most definitely disbelieve. Now, that means that Allah says, anyone who doesn't believe in all of the prophets, alayhim salatu wassalam, he is a kafir. And what's a kafir? Allah says, kafirun haqqa, most assuredly, certainly, with truth, with haqq, most definitely, these are the disbelievers. Why? Because they seek to draw a distinction in belief between Allah and his messengers alayhi wa salatu wa And they say, we'll believe in some and we'll disbelieve in the rest. No, no. Allah says that only believers are those, later Allah says, who believe in all of the prophets alayhi wa salatu wa and do not draw any distinction between them. Now, if we just look at the Yahud and the Nasara, how can the Yahud be believers when they refuse to accept Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wa salam as the prophet of Allah? If anything, Ma'adullah, forgive me for mentioning this, but they call him a bastard child. They call him an illegitimate child. Far from being a prophet, they call him an illegitimate child. And they refuse to believe in him. And they refuse to believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That 
The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they called him an imposter and they refused to believe in him. And the Christians believe in Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam but to such an extent that they commit kufr in their belief. They hail him as a god, the son of God, one of the trinity. And even if you take all of that aside, even if there is a Christian who does not believe in any of these things, still, when he draws a distinction between the messengers of Allah and says, I believe in some and I disbelieve in the rest, see, he can believe in every prophet, from Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu salam to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam. But when he refuses to accept the final messenger of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a messenger of Allah, then he has committed kufr. He is a kafir haqqa, as Allah says. And for him there is no hope of Jannah. No one will enter Jannah who has come after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without believing in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, why is it that these people, the Yahud and the Nasara, adamantly say that, look, sometimes in their politeness they may say, oh, Muhammad was a good man, but we do not believe he was a prophet. We do not believe he was a prophet. Why is it that they can say this? They refuse to accept Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as a messenger of Allah. Yet some Muslims are so <coughs> generous. They say, oh, it's all right. You don't have to believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We still consider you believers. We still consider you believers. You will get Jannah, don't worry. You don't have to accept the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a final messenger. Why are some Muslims so generous with a Jannah that they do not have themselves? When Allah says, those who seek to draw any distinction between the messengers of Allah and say we believe in some and disbelieve in the rest, these are the ones who are most definitely with truth the disbelievers. And then if someone says, well, you see, when they... But they do believe in the Prophet Muhammad wasallam and they speak good of him and they say he is a prophet. Well, if anyone says the Prophet wasallam is a prophet, then he no longer needs to call himself a Yahudi or a Nasrani, a Jew or a Christian. If he says he believes in the Prophet ﷺ, then he has to accept his religion as a whole. And then he becomes a Muslim. But then, in doing so, he has to accept the whole religion. But as Allah says, They seek to adopt a path which is in between these two things. But they can't. They can't. Anyway, in the remaining part of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, again, the Jews and the Christians at length. <coughs> Allah then mentions the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and his people whom Allah instructed to go and fight in the way of Allah. But they said, look, Musa, you go and your Lord go and both fight. We are waiting here, seated here, waiting for you. Allah mentions that story here. Allah mentions the story of the two sons of Adam, alayhi salatu wasalam, and how one of them killed the other, the first act of murder. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about certain laws, such as the law of amputating the hand for someone who steals. If he is caught and his guilt is proven, then his hand will be amputated. Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Ma'idah. The law remains intact. It has not been abrogated. And unlike some Muslims who claim that that law is barbaric, how can a verse of the Qur'an be barbaric? We see, these, see, these people, they, they, they feel they are more intelligent than Allah, they are more compassionate than Allah, they are kinder and more generous than Allah, they're willing to give away Allah's jannah to whom they want, they're willing to forgive whom Allah hasn't forgiven. Allah then speaks about the Jews again. Obviously not in favorable terms. Allah speaks about how they are excessive consumers of haram, how they are spies in Medina. Uh, Allah is speaking specifically about those Jews that were in Medina during the time of the Prophet and how they are spies, how they would spy on the Prophet and the Muslims, how they would distort words, so much. Allah then speaks about some of the laws that were given to the Jews and how they failed to uphold those laws in the Torah. Then after speaking about the Jews and the Christians at length, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers what their relationship should be with the Jews and the Christians with the people of the book. So I'll just translate the verses. Allah says, O believers, do not take the Yahud and the Nasara, the Jews and the Christians as friends. They are friends of one another. And whoever befriends them from amongst you, then he is of them. 
Verily, Allah does not guide those people who are sinful. Then you shall see those in whose hearts there is a disease, hastening to move amongst them, saying, we fear that a calamity may strike us. So it is highly possible that Allah may bring forth victory, or, something, or another good matter from unto himself. And then these people, the ones with a disease in their hearts, will become shameful and embarrassed at that which they concealed in their hearts. And on that occasion the believers will say, that are these the same people who swore their strongest oaths in the name of Allah that they shall be with you? The deeds of such people shall perish and they shall be the losers. O believers, whoever amongst you apostates from his religion, then soon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall bring forth the people whom he loves and who love him. They shall be soft and humble towards the believers, harsh and relentless against the disbelievers. They shall fight in the way of Allah and not fear the rebuke of any rebuking person. This is a bounty of Allah that he bestows upon whom he wishes and Allah is full of bounty. Allah is all knowing. Your only friends are Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those believers who establish salah and who give zakah and who are forever bowing and whoever befriends Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers then verily the party of Allah shall be dominant. O believers, do not take those people who have taken your religion, who have made your religion a thing of jest and mockery and a, a thing of play from amongst those who were given the book before you and the disbelievers, do not take them as your friends and fear Allah if you are true believers. Allah then again speaks about the Yahud and some of their blasphemies, like one of them, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولًا Allah says, the Jews have said Allah's hands are fastened and tied. I.e., he is stingy, miserly, and unable to spend. They called Allah a penny pincher. غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلْعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا Allah says, may their hands be tied and may they be cursed for what they have said. Nay, his hands are spread out. He spends how he wishes. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who have say Allah is Isa ibn Maryam, they have disbelieved. Those who say he is one of the tr- trinity, one of the three, they have disbelieved. Allah says, O oh, believers, do not go to extremes. Disbelievers, meaning uh, the people of the book, do not go to extremes in your religion by saying what is not true about Allah. And you see, then Isa alayhi salatu salam. Allah also mentions that the most intense in hatred towards believers are the Jews and the mushrikeen. Now some people misunderstand this verse. They think that the Christians are the closest and the most loving towards us. But Allah is speaking about a certain group of Christians. Those who are humble, who still follow their monastic way, and who as soon as they hear the truth of Islam and the words of the Quran, they weep because they have recognized the truth and they embrace Islam immediately. These are the ones who are the closest. Otherwise if they choose not to embrace, even though the truth has come to them, they are not those Nasara that Allah is praising. Allah then mentions some laws such as the laws of making promises and how we shouldn't break our promise. And if we do break a promise or if we do break an oath, then the compensation is to feed ten people uh, from is to feed ten people. Now that, that would equal about uh, you see the fidya that we have every day, like Sadaqat al is probably about three pounds, three pounds fifty. Times that by ten, thirty pounds. That's the kafara for breaking a promise. And whoever can't pay that then they have a choice. Either they then fast for three days or they emancipate or free a slave, which isn't relevant today. Well not relevant but most people will not be able to apply that today. This is the law of breaking a promise. Now then Allah also speaks about the law of gambling and alcohol and how both are an evil abomination and that there's no difference between the two. The evil that Allah has mentioned for gambling, uh, sorry, for alcohol, Allah has mentioned is the same for gambling. Yet some of us draw a distinction between the two. So we won't go near alcohol, but we do have a flutter on the national lottery and we buy tickets, we buy raffle tickets, we gamble and we say it's okay. We're just giving to charity. It's an investment. It's a trade. 
Allah but there's no distinction between the two. All the evils that Allah has pointed out for alcohol are the same for gambling. Allah forbids both, both of them the same verse. Allah mentions some more laws about hunting in the state of Ihram. And then, again, some more laws about animals and how the mushrikeen in their superstition had designated certain animals to be godlike, sorry, to be animals for the sake of God in the name of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says none of these things are true and they are merely ascribing lies to Allah. Some more laws about testimony, etc. And then finally towards the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was salam and Allah mentions a particular story about the spread and the whole surah has been named after this particular story in the surah. The spread, the story is that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was salam when he called his people to support him, to believe in him and to assist him, then a handful of people joined him and responded to his call and devoted their lives to his service and the service of his religion. They were like the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, but obviously they weren't that many in number, just a handful. They were known as the Hawariyeen. Allah has called them Hawariyeen in the Holy Quran. Now, they responded to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam's call and they were his disciples. Now, once these disciples requested Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and said to him that pray to Allah that he sends down to us a special spread, table spread, miraculously from the heavens, from Jannah, on which there is food of Jannah, so that the spread with the food may descend upon us and we may eat of it and partake of it. So Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam said to them that fear Allah and do not make these kind of demands. Because the Banu Israel, the Jews well before them, they would make the same demands from their Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Do this, do that, do this, tell Allah to show us this, tell Allah to show us that, tell Allah to give us this. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam said fear Allah. And another reason for telling them to fear Allah is because sometimes when people would ask for miracles, they were demanding a miracle in order to believe in the truth. It's just like, we, we can't believe, we don't trust you. Show us a miracle and we we'll believe in you. So Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam said to them, fear Allah and don't make such demands. So they said, look, the only reason we are asking is not because we doubt you, but because we want to eat, we want to eat of this blessed food of Jannah. And although we believe in you, we want our hearts to be content. And we don't mistrust you, we do trust you, but we want to be convinced with an assurity and total confidence that whatever you have said to us, you have spoken the truth. And we also want to become witnesses to this miracle. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam understood their request. And he prayed to Allah. That oh Allah send a spread from the heavens for us. That will be a time of joy and feasting for us. And it will also be a miracle and a sign from unto yourself. And feed us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in reply, I shall send the spread to you. But whoever disbelieves from amongst you, after this, then I shall inflict such a punishment upon him that I have not given to anyone in all the worlds. Because then to mistrust the Prophet wasallam, or to disbelieve or to doubt after seeing such a miracle, that is kufr. With this, we ended today's section. And um, tomorrow, there's one just, there's about five verses left of Surah Al Ma'idah, related to the same topic about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam and his conversation with Allah on the Day of Judgment. Because we'll read that tomorrow, I'll also comment on it tomorrow, and then we'll move on to the next surah. Before I end, I would just like to say one thing about this. You see, sometimes when a person says to another that. Show me evidence. Give me proof. <coughs> or swear in the name of Allah. Or tell me the truth. <coughs> or someone repeatedly requests the other to clarify something. Or to reassure them. This doesn't mean that the person necessarily doubts them. And we should be extremely careful and we shouldn't go on the defensive straight away. And if someone says, well, show me some proof we become sensitive and defensive and we say, don't you trust me? Why do you accuse me of lying? 
I've told you, and my word should be enough. But you see, we're all human. And sometimes one individual may not have the benefit of the background information that the other person has. And even though the other person can easily understand something, or the other person can easily believe in something, they may be able to do that because of their individual circumstances or the luxury of background information. But the other person does not have that luxury or comfort. And furthermore, we are all human. We have our own doubts. We have our own weaknesses. And we are always prone to the evil thoughts of shaitan and the onslaught from shaitan of whisperings and of doubts and suspicion. So we may need to be reassured. Just like once the Prophet ﷺ was in the masjid and one of his wives came to see him. It's a hadith read by Imam Bukhari and others. So the wife, one of the wives came to see him. So after she ended her visit, she wished to return to her chamber. Prophet ﷺ, it was dark at night. Prophet ﷺ said, let me assist you and walk you back to the house. But obviously he would still remain in the masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ was walking with his wife, Umm Mu'minin Safiya radiyallahu ta'ala anha, and just whilst they were walking towards her chamber, two Sahaba radiyallahu anhum from amongst the Ansar, they happened to come up, walk up. Now, as soon as they saw the Prophet وسلم, with another woman, they instantly turned away and began hurriedly making their exit in another direction. So the Prophet وسلم, said to them, Wait. Then he said to them, This is Safiya, my wife. So both Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, Subhanallah, Ya Rasulullah, we did not doubt anything. We did not suggest anything otherwise. So the Prophet said, No. You see, shaitan runs in every man like this running and the circulation of blood. And I feared that he would cast a doubt in your hearts. So before he did so, the Prophet clarified it. So that they would experience no doubt. They would experience no doubt. And being human, being humans, we, we have those doubts and we have our whisperings, etc. Or we may not be able to be convinced and we may not be able to believe with as much certainty as a person next to us. I'm talking about in everyday things. So if someone says to another, look, show me proof, give me evidence, reassure me, or tell me more about this, or clarify the matter once again, or repeat what you were saying before, or swear in the name of Allah, or take an oath. You see, people shouldn't become defensive and sensitive. Why? And they shouldn't say, well, don't you trust me? Am I lying? Do you accuse me of lying? That's not going to get anybody anywhere. And we should understand the other person's need. Maybe at that time, they you know, genuinely uh, need to be reassured, or they genuinely need more evidence. And the proof of this is this, this verse and another verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, quotes Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam's story. Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِّي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَىٰ قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قَالَ بَلَىٰ وَلَاكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِهِ And remember when Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam said, Oh my Lord, show me how you will resurrect the dead, how you will give life to the dead. So Allah said, أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ Don't you believe? He's speaking to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibrahim. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam said, Qala bala, of course I do. Walakin liyatma'inna qalbi, but only so that my heart may be content. Only so that my heart may be content. I.e., I do believe. I do believe. But there is a degree higher than belief, which is belief with conviction in such a way that my heart is content with the truth. And I experience no doubt whatsoever. You see, that's what Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam said. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled his promise. Allah fulfilled his wish. And he showed him, he demonstrated to him how he will resurrect the dead. And here again, the followers of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam, these were his closest followers. You see, these were the ones who responded to his call. These were the ones who sacrificed their lives for his sake. These were the ones who were his disciples. These were the chosen ones. Yet, they requested a miracle. Sayyidina Isa salam warned them that do not ask for these miracles, do not make such demands. Don't fear Allah. So they explain themselves that, oh Isa salam, it's not like we doubt. And it's not like we are going to believe after we see the miracle. But 
One, we wish to eat from this blessed food. That's for us that this, this is not part of the issue. They actually said to Isa alayhi salam, we wish to see this miracle so that our hearts may be content. And so that we may be convinced that everything you have said to us is the truth. So even though they didn't doubt him, they were looking for a higher degree of conviction and certainty. And if this is the case with the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam and the disciples of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam whom Allah has praised in the Qur'an and who are guaranteed to be the people of Jannah because they were his chosen disciples, they were his Sahaba, then who are we? So at times we may need reassuring, we may need convincing, we may require more than just a person's word of mouth. And if we are ever in that position that someone is not satisfied with our word of mouth, but they require us to swear in the name of Allah, or to provide proof and testimony, or to give evidence, or to reassure them, or to convince them, or to swear or assert our truthfulness repeatedly, then we should understand, and we shouldn't be defensive and sensitive, and we shouldn't refuse to do so. Allah did it. Allah did it. For His Prophet ﷺ, and Allah did it for His Prophet's disciples. <coughs> so we can surely do this. Uh, I just mention this as a very, as a point, because, as a very delicate point, because many people misunderstand this issue. And this verse came along, and I thought I'd just use this opportunity in the light of this verse, in the verse of Surah Al Baqarah, to explain this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawheed to understand. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. This lecture was given by Shaykh Abu Yusuf Riyadhul Haq and has been presented to you by Al Kothar Productions. For further information, additional lectures and books, contact us on 0121-773-5191 or alternatively by post at Al Kothar Productions, P.O. Box 6008, Birmingham, B10-0UW. United Kingdom or visit our website at www.alkotharacademy.org Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh